Hi, welcome to Readings from Ballet, a selection of extracts from students' thesis work for exhibiting at the Ballet School of Architecture Altenship. I'm Z for Landscape Architecture Program. I'm going to speak about my master thesis, Landscape Notes, the mission of actors in Parkland work. It was supported by my supervisor, Eric Gilbert, and the course coordinator, Tim Woodman. The research is based on the premise that life is deconstructed by anthropologists teaming go with lines and then woven into a mesh. The knots loop between the rims where the lines meet and the matter where the mesh refers. This paper aims to expand Ingo's series by addressing the properties of knots along these lines. A knot is interpreted in the Cambridge Dictionary as a jump made by tying together. As one of Anik acknowledges, rather than chance, glue and the tiny plastic ties common today. Its connection permeates the domains of things from the inside with everlasting flexibility. As landscape is a vibrant meshwork, a visual vector composing ecological, cultural, political and uh, actor connections. So I introduce the material semiotic approach of A and T. Actor network series to describe the vitality of this deterritorialization. It refers to everything existing in an incessantly fluid network of relations emitted by the actors. This method defines a relation as a line and where the lines meet, there is notes. To review these notes, I acknowledge the method of itinerary experiments invented by the French sociologist Jean-Yves Petitou, which refers to following actors immersed in this site and interpreting the exclusive domain by observing the actions. Actors' response are a reflection of the vitality in the landscape such as the expression, gestures, and landscapes involving emotion, imagination, questioning, and memories. Alternatively, non-human actors, such as biological, architectural, or atmospheric beings, present the phenomena on the site. The site which my research is located is the Parkland Work in London where is a railway reclined by the spontaneous ecosystem over 20 years of abandonment. Before open to the public in 1984, a group of residents and motivated environmentalists complained and negotiated with the local councils for years, which has formed a volunteer organization, the Friends of Parkland Work. Now the site is well known as a regeneration landscape where biodiversity have exploded between tracks, embankments, and bridges. The research mainly follows two human actors on their itineraries. The first protagonist is Percy Mears, the present chairman of the Friends of Parkland Work. The second itinerary is with Alexandra Nielsen Lehner, who lives in a neighborhood two streets away. She is a long-term regular participant here. So this paper takes seven main actors on the site, which are beds, councils, railway remnants, residents, trees, visitors, and volunteers. Their behaviors and the relative phenomena highlighted four landscape notes. The first knot is about succession, not succession, which describes the balance between meadows and woodlands. And the second knot, Killer not silver, this debate the issues of tree sacrifice resulting from arch breed maintenance. Then it comes to the third, alien alienation, involves the controversy of graffiti in public landscape. The final note, Kiss of a Lost, focuses on the insights of baby lost trees in visitors' participations. Location, associated notes, and physical actors are direct attributes of knots in the landscape. Other indirect properties were investigated after in-depth information collection. How actors dialogue in knots, how this dialogue influenced the evolution 
of knots, and how knots are interconnected to weave meshwork. Technology is worse as chaos. The knotting view embracing complexity and multiplicity. The, the logic of knots is like multiphonic music. It is multi-threaded with varying degrees of compression, and knots are multi-scaled with diffuse connectivities along no real edges. What's more, they are also adaptable, which introduce companion niche between controlling and letting it be. In the multilateral politics, in the post-anthropocene, the actors in parkland work have been already experimenting with dialogue in lieu of dictatorship, though they may not be conscious of that. The knot metaphor suggests a more fairer, resilient future. Is each citizenship replaceable by urban inhabitants? Is it not be the time for humanity live into the vortex of pluralism and live alongside other inhabitants in dialogue? Here are some extracts from my thesis paragraph. Knots have always been there. Knots have been there before words were invented. In 2006 BC, the ancient Incas used kipu, which means knots on a rope to record and communicate. Please imagine intrigues, recipes, romance, parsing tigers, rotated saplings and landscape all make into knots. Or colors, tombs, and reshifts are transformed into tightness, quality, position, structure, and texture of knots. A slipped overhand stop initial at the end of a line and the leaves are bind open to unrevival. Succession is a montage of chronologically botanical phenomena progressing along a rim. Visitors, gyms, complaints, bats, and unpredictable occurrence invade this chapter, noting a provisional endpoint, which is the stopper knot. Alexandra recommends a picnic at the edge of the platform. Reminding of the Soviet novel, Roadside Picnic. Visitors like stalkers in novel, three parts into the eccentric forbidden rooms left by the last civilization and scarving to the rooms. Landscape architects and uh, adventitious plants are embracing the complexity of creation as well. Industrial civilization is lashed in a knot of urban nature, with many actors strongling their lines into surface under the tension. Like Gaia, a powerful intrusive force that drags all minds on this planet into chaos, no civilization would ever truly end. Aristotle described human beings as political animals. When citizens came to debate the good and the bad of the city, stars, mountains, and woods had no voice. Nature was regarded as culture counterpart, independent of human intervention, hastily deciphered in the geology, atmosphere, and existence. The horizontal practice of humans and non-humans have blurred the boundary between nature and humanity. As Frey Massieu reshapes the world into a system of associated networks of agents, nature is defined as spontaneous unfolding with that. The companion ecology, enshrining the mutual shaping, introduces a companion niche between humans and non-humans. The land is translated by Karl Marx as the fundamental instrument of labor. Donna Haraway provokes, where the non-hierarchical tentacles grab the actors around knots into a core labor alliance. Our complication is protected in the post-Anthropocene. A landscape open to diversity and sustainability must be conscious of the note. Celine Bowman unlock a multilaterary political possibility for the post-Anthropocene in Parliament of Plants. The not thinking landscape management is aligned with the Parliament of Things to coordinate the actors on the site. 
emphasizing their intrinsic merits rather than instrumental interests. The common truth is that there is no separate common interest among beings. Hence, arbiter is pedagogical and conflicts are the norms. Humanity as one of the negotiating table players must agree that peace is an equal possibility. That's all, thank you. Hi, my name is Marlena Hellmann and I'm an MA landscape architecture student. And today I'm reading from my master thesis, which is entitled, The Liberating Power of Maps, Landscape as its own Cartographer. I will begin with a short summary. Can we give landscape a voice of its own by positioning it as its own cartographer? My master thesis, The Liberating Power of Maps, Landscape as its own Cartographer, is tackling a question to which there can be no answer. Cartography or mapping as the actual process of creating a map is always a human act. Therefore, in my research, I regard the goal of establishing a map without a human cartographer as a vanishing point that, like the horizon, cannot be reached and moves further and further away the closer one gets to it. Nonetheless, by attempting to approach this vanishing point, we as landscape architects can witness a tremendous horizon unfold before us. The investigation is divided into four chapters and begins with a glimpse into the emotional and scientific significance of glaciers in Switzerland and the tendency of humans to anthropomorphize the frozen landscape. Glaciers are often perceived as living archives of Earth's history that are slowly but surely dying due to climate change. My research strives towards the ambition to not only mourn the glacier's death, but to breathe new life into the endangered landscape by granting it a voice of its own. I looked at the example of Terra Zero, a forest that owns itself. By the use of a so-called smart contract, the forest can manage its own resources and make decisions about timber sales to ensure its continued existence. This example reveals that before we can give agency to landscapes, we must identify existing power structures that constrain them. Only then can we dismantle the mechanisms first and transfer, transfer empowerment to the landscape itself. The following chapter explores the complex legal status of the glaciers in Switzerland, which are classified as public land and not clearly owned. Although Swiss glaciers are legally ownerless, humans seem to have increasingly conquered them over the past centuries until the invincible giants were transitioned to scientifically tangible objects. A journey back in time unveils that humankind managed to gain power over the previously feared terra incognita through the creation of maps. Through cartographic illustration, with a focus on measurement and fixed representation, glaciers have been stripped off their inherent agency. This transformation highlights the need for a critical reflection on the impact of positivist cartographic practices. The third chapter examines different methods on challenging and transforming power structures of the map. In the history of humankind, mapping has served as an instrument both of both conquest and liberation. The exploration of diverse methodologies in critical cartography reveals the transformative potential of maps as agents of change. James Corner emerged as one of the scarce landscape architects who explored the possibilities inherent in mapping, both in theoretical discourse and in practical application. Corner's explorations finally helped to answer the methodological question of how does a map work? In the final chapter, I conduct a crucial examination where I aim to endow glaciers with unique characteristics and their own voice through the process of mapping. This investigation is grounded in critical cartography methodologies as discussed previously. 
The chapter contains three mapping experiments that I designed to demonstrate an initial exploration into the process of mapping. Critical cartography encompasses a vast array of approaches and the possibilities in inherent in mapping are limitless. However, in this context, it is not a human gaze that is being represented, but rather that of landscape itself. So to sum up, my master thesis sought to inspire landscape architects to continuously strive for the unattainable, to challenge conventional notions, and to find new ways in articulating landscapes, desires, and identities. When we enable landscapes to shape our perception of the world, we can hear it whispering its stories to us. Okay, now I will read an extract from the first chapter of my thesis. In September 2019, as the summer is slowly winding down, about 250 people in hiking boots and black robes gather at 2,700 meters in Switzerland to say farewell. It is the funeral of the Pizzol Glacier, which has melted so significantly in recent years that it was ultimately stripped of its glacier status. It is thus dead. The idea of glaciers as living beings reaches far back into history and many people feel an emotional attachment to the cold matter. The significance of glacier melt extends beyond the simple transformation of ice into water, which eventually dissipates in the valleys. Glaciers hold emotional and scientific value as, rep as repositories of cultural and climatic memories. The analysis of ice cores with their annual layers containing trace substances and gases offers insights into the evolution of our world as it is today. These vast ice layers, some spanning kilometers in length, can preserve plant and human remnants over centuries to millennia. Hence, the melting of glaciers represents the loss of a precious archive of Earth's history. Moreover, glaciers are dynamic formations that move an average of one meter per day in the Alps. Researchers today record this motion with seismometers, an instrument that responds to sounds and movement of the ground. When one listens to these recordings, it almost seems as if the glacier is breathing and has a heartbeat. Snow, fern, and ice thus manifest as a majestic spectacle as the glacier descends from the lofty mountain peaks to the valley below, appearing untainable in its movement. Unfortunately, the, the alleged invincibility of glaciers has turned out to be a fallacy, and today the fear of their disappearance is greater than that of the ice masses themselves. By the end of the 21st century, scientific projections indicate that it is highly likely that more than 90% of glaciers in Switzerland will disappear due to human-induced climate change. Okay, and now I will read an extract from my uh, fourth chapter, which is about this map that I created. In mapping experiment number two, the glaciers have finally transcended the confines of the map field designed by the famous Swiss cartographer Guillaume-Henri Dufour and are now traversing a neutral terrain. When humans map glaciers, they never depict the dynamic nature of these majestic giants within the fabric of the landscape. Every year, when spring arrives, parts of glaciers transform into meltwater and, making, and make their way down into the valley until they merge with the sea. The enormity of this process surpasses the representation offered by Dufour's or Siegfried's map fragments. Furthermore, glaciers never travel alone. Sediments, fish, flowers, leaves, wood, and countless other organisms join them on their voyage downstream. If glaciers were their own cartogra cartographers, 
Would they not regale us with the tales of their adventures and companions on their long journey? Perhaps they would show us how their waters carry forget-me-nots, edelweiss, meadowsweet, and marsh marigold to new destinations, spreading their seeds over the land. Maybe they would illustrate how the wind gently blows maple, elder, oak, and willow leaves into the cool water that propels the tree's gifts down the river. Furthermore, they might tell the story of a nimble trout who made acquaintance with a silvery glistening grayling, a well-traveled eel, and a curious gudgeon. These are the extracts and plottings that reveal much more about glaciers than altitude data, hiking routes, and mountain peaks named after scientists. If glaciers possessed the ability to communicate as cartographers, they would likely teach us that we cannot perceive them in isolation from the vast interconnected system in which all entities, such as water, animals, plants, stones, soil, and ultimately ourselves as humans, are on a journey that we can only master together. This is it. Um, thank you very much for watching me and listening to me. And also thank you to Tim and Curti for being fantastic supervisors. Um, and now I will pass it on to Ruby and say goodbye. Thanks, Marlena. Hi, I'm Ruby Zielinski, and I'm graduating from the MLA program at the Bartlett. And today I'm going to read a chapter from my thesis called Think Like a Gardener. And first, I just want to say thank you to my thesis supervisor, Kirsty Badenoch, who supported me through this process. Uh, I really have enjoyed all of our conversations. So thank you. And thanks to Tim Waterman, our thesis coordinator, for leading the way. My thesis is inspired by many parts of my life, but is dedicated to my grandmother, who is the best gardener that I know. So to start, I figured I would recall a memory that sparked the direction for my thesis. My background is in operations and maintenance of public parks. And at a young age, I was promoted to the director of operations for the parks organization that I was working for. Coming into the role as a young female, I knew it was going to be challenging, but I was constantly reminded about it. When I would meet with a contractor or maintenance worker on site, they would always ask, oh, I'm here to meet, um, you know, the maintenance guy, or uh, when is your boss going to get here? And um, I would always get this look of surprise when they found out that that was me. So this led me to wonder why there aren't more women in these leadership roles. And I began to dig into the history of maintenance practices and found that women have been in the garden for a long time. But I also found that the root of the issue might have been tied to more deeply rooted cultural stories. So my thesis explores these cultural undertones while also examining current landscape architecture practices and how gender influences them with personal narratives woven through as short anecdotes. So welcome to my little garden. Um, I'm sorry if there's a little bit of interference, but I figured that this is the best setting to do this reading today. So uh, let's begin. Today, it seems that every square inch of earth has been impacted or controlled in some way by humans. Paul Crutzen defines this period as the Anthropocene, where humans have interfered so much with natural environments that the planet's climate and ecosystems are impacted in irreversible ways. Scientists are still debating whether the impact caused by humans is severe enough yet to move into the new geological epoch. However, looking at the earth as not having any areas left without human intervention, the argument could be made that the planet is a garden and the humans are the gardeners. Jules Clement recognized this in his writings contained in the planetary garden. He said, the planet functions as a single living entity, limited by the confines of the biosphere, and we do indeed find ourselves in the conditions of a garden, an autonomous and fragile enclosure where every factor interacts with the whole and the whole with each of the creatures present. All that remains is to find the gardeners. If humans are the gardeners, then we haven't been very good ones. The enormous threats to biodiversity loss, deforestation, mass extinctions, and more, our garden is crying for help. When Clement says find the gardeners, he does not mean people must plant flowers and vegetables. To Clement, the gardener understands that every action has a reaction. In order to sustain a healthy garden, one has to observe and then act, working with rather than against natural systems. In a time when Qatar is shipping seeds of grass into the desert from the United States to create football pitches for the World Cup, and small island villages are turning to digital mapping to save their culture, 
once they are buried by water due to rising sea levels. Where are the gardeners? So I end this section with a poem from Olafur Eliasson, uh, and it goes like this. Look down. Notice how the earth is holding you up. See down to earth. Make a garden. The garden is also the gardener, and you are the garden. Swing back and forth. Extend your senses into the garden. Become with your local environment. Commit compassionately. Stay with the trouble, our garden plan. No need to hurry to Mars. Now, look up again, and notice the intensity with which the earth holds you up. So I don't have time to read my whole thesis, but there is a chapter that explains the kind of gender dynamics that I was looking at. So I figured I'd cover that today. As the climate changes, the world desperately needs translators between biological species. We have lost communication in the fight for control and order. These attitudes towards the planet could be described as masculine energies. Having masculine energy does not necessarily mean that these decisions are made only by men, but in a masculine mindset, also described as the more logical, pragmatic, structured way of thinking that results in controlled outcomes and predicted returns. Clinical social worker Gareth S. Hill describes four different patterns that underline human activity, static feminine, dynamic masculine, static masculine, and dynamic feminine. These patterns sit in opposition to one another within all human consciousness. When describing masculine patterns, Hill says, the highest goal of the dynamic masculine is the mastery and harnessing of nature in service of life-giving technology. In the case of the garden, a masculine perspective could be very dangerous, if not balanced. Hill goes on to say, when unbridled in relation to the expression of the other three patterns, it is willful, determined, and goal-directed at the expense of what is life-giving and natural. Hill points out that each of these four patterns has a negative approach if one dominates over another, and the key here is balance. The feminine energy is described as more fluid, dynamic, and unpredictable. Rules tend to be bent in order to follow intuition rather than a step-by-step -step process. The feminine energy also perceives time differently. She thinks it a circular motion rather than a linear one. Everything is interconnected and moves through its own cycles. This is precisely the type of thinking Comont speaks about. A garden revolves around cycles of time and is entirely nonlinear. So why do we impose such a rigid program on our natural spaces? These masculine and feminine themes are echoed in deep-rooted culture stories in Western society. Carolyn Merchant's book, Reinventing Eden, outlines two main storylines that define our incessant need to control nature. One based on the story of Adam and Eve, and one based on scientific theory and discovery. These plots put the masculine energy, Adam, science, as the hero, and the feminine energy, Eve, nature, as the villain. If one side of the coin is searching for the Garden of Eden, and the other aims to unveil the secrets of nature, science, and technology, there seems to be room for a third act. And I think the third act is the role of the planetary gardener. Merchant would describe it as a partnership, saying, the tensions between the two plots create a need for a new story that entails a sustainable partnership with nature. In any healthy relationship, there are compromises, respect for values, and a foundation of love to support and care for the other, and some might call this quality trust. If a garden has a perceived consciousness following Hill's research, the approach should be one coming from a trusting relationship between masculine and feminine dynamics. The balance between masculine and feminine energies could lead to a better understanding of how to create solution, solutions for the planet. The logic and strategy of the masculine could collaborate with the empathetic, intuitive feminine energy, then maybe the world has a shot at mending its relationship with the garden. So my thesis is organized in the same way a garden is. It's nonlinear, it is meant to be explored at the leisure of the reader. Each section is meant to complement one another, but not set out in a particular order. Instead, each is in conversation with the other in an attempt to understand the garden. It is also not exhaustive. Sections could be added to continue the journey to becoming a global gardener. The exploration weaves through personal narratives that have guided my understanding of the garden with theory and research about the history of gardening, its gendered background, and contemporary management styles that aim to work with rather than against natural systems. 
To frame these stories, I have also included a log of my own garden at home in the hopes of further understanding these processes up close and personal. This garden has many plots to walk through, all searching for what it means to think like a gardener. So um, if you go to thinklikeagardener.com, you can read the entire thesis and see all the different kind of sections um, together, as well as the garden log that I kept um, throughout the year of the garden that's actually um, behind me. So thank you so much for sitting with me today and listening. And I'm going to pass it off to Ellen and out to wrap us up for the day. So thank you so much. Hello. Uh, thank you, Ruby, for your reading. My name is Elena Temushunaita. Um, and I'm also um, MLA landscape architecture student, finishing my second year. And I will read you from my thesis, Know-How Care Action, depicting feral ecosystems as a way of rethinking the relationship between human and non-human. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank my thesis supervisor, Eric Gubert, and module coordinator, Tim Waterman, for all the guidance with this thesis. I would also like to thank Marty Franz Badlori, founder of EMF Landscape Architects, for sharing his knowledge in the interview with me. His studio's Girona Shores project in Catalonia became a core case study analyzed in his thesis. So in the thesis, I look at the role of landscape representation, such as drawing and photography when designing with feral ecosystems. And I use this term, feral ecosystems, in the thesis to emphasize the humanist ecology point of view seeing human life as part of nature. And the term feral, or wild, advocates for importance of dynamic and in some cases unpredictable interaction between these different ecosystems. Landscape architect Gilles Clement's key design principle, observe in order to act and work with whenever possible against as little as possible, becomes a core value to evaluate a successful landscape project. So using representational means to think and to design play a key role in landscape architects' daily routine. When we start a new project, first thing we do as a landscape architect, we, we sketch our ideas, we start drawing. Uh, so the thesis is exploring successful examples of drawings that act as a tools to design with these feral ecosystems making sure that the project is a result of dynamic collaboration between human and non-human. So the thesis is divided into three parts, each exploring different methods of landscape representation. I will now introduce each part and follow up with a short reading from each section. So first, know-how looks at drawings as essentially diagrams that act as guidelines for maintenance and self-reliance particularly explore, exploring the pow power of clarity of their diagrammatic drawing to disseminate knowledge, as well as flexibility embedded within the diagram not to restrict the changes within the project. Looking at Gilles Clement's drawings, we can feel extreme clarity and generosity of information. His drawing uses manual of the garden in movement is a good example of this. It is a set of diagrammatic guidelines outlining what one should do to start and maintain the garden in motion. The drawings are drawn in a plan view with small captions at the bottom of each drawing starting from the description of the present condition of the existence of a tree and very first action that needs to be taken by the user, sowing seeds. The aim is for both the garden and gardener to have an equal say, and so the second action, the decision where a pathway should go, is taken only when seedlings have established and picked their preferred spots. As planting develops further, its growth also becomes influenced by a third character in a drawing, the pre-existing tree. The drawing is done by hand with a real delicateness and lightness of a brush, almost emphasizing the lightness of human intervention needed for the process to work. Its clear yet playful nature invites us to give it a go ourselves. In the end, it looks so easy and fun. All you need to do 
is to throw some seeds in the air. So the second part, uh, care, explores various methods to capture the notion of time in a drawing, particularly investigating the relationship between circular and linear perception of time and how it helps to redefine the role of care and ritual within human and non-human life. The attentiveness to time through a non-linear point of view can be observed in calendar illustrations by Limburg brothers in the religious manuscript made between 1413 and 1416. Presenting 12 pages of a generalized calendar depicting representations of labors of the months, the regular rhythms of agricultural activities is positioned in a book together with regular rhythm of prayer. Each illustration is accompanied by astronomical elements such as solar chariot and lunar calendar showing the understanding of the relationship between the natural rhythms of the earth and human daily activities. June, is showing peasants mowing grass with a scythe and raking it into the piles. Look at the, looking at this image evokes interesting similarities to the drawing on a photo by Landscape Architects EMF, illustrating a diverse landscape mosaic resulting from different management regimes. In both drawings, Landscape design emerges in front of us as it is being shaped by humans and their tools. Uh, so lastly, the thesis look at the drawing as action, examining the role of intuition in the design process and performative aspects of producing the drawing that can expand beyond paper to the landscape itself. Drawings for us can also mean walking on sites with maintenance workers, discussing what needs to be done and marking decisions directly on site with spray paint. The longer we work on this project, the fewer drawings we make on paper or using computer. Marty French. Interview experience between myself and Marty French has helped me to define this method, drawing as action. On the day of a scheduled Microsoft Teams call between myself and French, he had to rush to the site unexpectedly after receiving a phone call about the availability of the tractor to open up a new path. Eager to see how it progressed, he used the time of an interview to walk around the site with a phone answering my questions and at the same time showing me around the site and checking the new path. In some cases, Questions that answered in a form of thoughts about the direct environment French was walking in at the time. For instance, a question about the meaning of confetti in his practice is followed by reflection. Look how the light here is different. French points the camera to the bushy side of the pathway with good glittering light on the leaves. He then spans the camera following the pathway. This is because a new opening has been cut and points at the new window with a view. Motions and hand gestures almost act as drawing in the air that helps French to articulate what is happening in the landscape. In essence, this experience was the usual walk French undertakes with maintenance team to decide what needs to be done next and improved. Sometimes those hand gestures take a form of literal marking on the site with red spray paint or string. And these are some screenshots of uh, my interview with Mar Marty Franchi as we were walking the site. So that's it. Uh, thank you for joining us for Readings from the Bartlett. To explore the autumn show further, please visit our exhibition at 22 Gordon Street, Bloomsbury, which is open until 6th of October. Or visit our online show, link in the description box. Thank you and good evening.